I heard the bells on Christmas Day, their old familiar carols play, and wild and sweet the words repeat. Well, hello there, and welcome to day eight of the 12 days of Craftlet. Today, we have a story from William Dean Howells, who was born in 1837 and died in 1920. The story is called Christmas Every Day, and it was originally published in 1892. Remember that while you're listening, because all the things about Jerome K. Jerome that sound modern are present here too. If you've joined me before for a previous round of the 12 Days of Craftlet, you may remember hearing this story before. This time, however, an actual child is reading the child's parts. And I think that adds a sprinkle of joy to the already entertaining story. I've really enjoyed everything that I've ever read by Howells because he had no truck with elitist snooty writing. And yet, he was one of the literary legends of the Bostonian group that started and set the tone for the Atlantic Monthly, which is still going strong today. And I imagine there are plenty of people who would look at that magazine and think, yeah, elitist. After listening to the story today, I hope anyone who feels like that would take a second look. I think William Dean Howells would be pleased. Following that fun dramatization of Christmas Every Day, we have a newcomer to the craft lit ranks, but someone I know we will hear from again, Samuel McCord Crothers from 1857 to 1927, an interesting lifetime. I thought William Dean Howells wrote a lot and, and then I looked at what Crothers wrote. He, he might have him beat. I couldn't find very much biographical information on this man, but if you know anything, please share it in the comments. He sounds like a really interesting figure in the world of essay and story writing from his time. He started in 1874 with an undergraduate degree from what would become Princeton, and then a divinity degree at Union Theological Seminary in 1877, became a Presbyterian minister, and then in 1881, he resigned from the Presbyterian Church and converted to Unitarianism in 1882. So that's a lot of religion, right? It's not inappropriate for the season or anything, but I think the importance of Carruthers' genially progressive voice during his lifetime is just as needed now as it was then. He was a togetherizer instead of a societal divisiveizer. And in fact, he wrote a pro-women's suffrage book or long essay that couldn't help but gently nudge the fraught and sometimes violent suffragette movement into a position where it would be ludicrous to disagree with him and not give the vote to women. We have a little of that same gift of his today and tomorrow with two Christmas essays. Today, Crothers will channel Dickens Scrooge for us in what I suppose could be considered fan fiction, like proto fan fiction. I think you'll enjoy it. And then we end today with Why the Chimes Rang, a story that was requested by Craftlet listener Martha Donnelly and written by Raymond McDonald Alden. He lived from 1873 to 1924, pretty much the same as our other guys. And he was also an American scholar and educator. And this one's a real treat because I was able to find a cleaned up recording of an old radio version of this story taken off of a 78 RPM album, The Thick Ones. The story is in the vein of The Little Drummer Boy. So if you know that, I think you will find this to be just as pleasant and sweet a story as that. Here we go. Christmas Every Day by W.D. Howells, read in English, adapted as a radio play by Brian Hostick and Jessica Mells. My little girl came into my study, and as she always did Saturday mornings before breakfast, asked for a story. I tried to beg off, for I was very busy, but she wouldn't let me, so I began. Well, once there was a little pig. Papa, I've heard little pig stories till I'm perfectly sick of them. Well, what kind of story shall I tell then? About Christmas. It's getting to be the season. It's past Thanksgiving already. It seems to me that I've told as often about Christmas as I have about little pigs. No difference. Christmas is more interesting. Well, okay. Well, then, I'll tell you about the little girl that wanted it Christmas every day in the year. How would you like that? First rate. Very well, then. This little pig... Hey, oh, oh, what are you hitting me for? Because you said little pig instead of little girl. 
I should like to know what's the difference between a little pig and a little girl that wanted it Christmas every day. Papa, if you don't go on, I'll give it to you. Well, once there was a little girl who liked Christmas so much that she wanted it to be Christmas every day in the year. And as soon as Thanksgiving was over, she began to send postal cards to the old Christmas fairy to ask if she mightn't have it. But the old fairy never answered any of the postals, and after a while the little girl found out that the fairy was pretty particular and wouldn't notice anything but letters. Not even correspondence cards and envelopes, but real letters on sheets of paper and sealed outside with a monogram, or your initial anyway. So then she began to send her letters, and in about three weeks, or just the day before Christmas it was, she got a letter from the fairy, saying she might have it Christmas every day for a year, and then they would see about having it longer. The little girl was a good deal excited already, preparing for the old-fashioned once-a-year Christmas that was coming the next day, and perhaps the fairy's promise didn't make much of an impression on her as it would have at some other time. She just resolved to keep it to herself and surprise everybody with it as it kept coming true, and then it slipped out of her mind altogether. She had a splendid Christmas. She went to bed early so as to let Santa Claus have a chance at the stockings, and in the morning she was up the first of anybody and went and felt them and found hers all lumpy with packages of candy and oranges and grapes and pocket-books and rubber balls and all kinds of small presents, and her big brothers with nothing but the tongs in them, and her young lady sisters with a new silk umbrella, and her papas and mamas with potatoes and pieces of coal wrapped up in tissue paper, just as they always had every Christmas. Then she waited around till the rest of the family were up, and she was the first to burst into the library, when the doors were opened, and look at the large presents laid out on the library table books and portfolios and boxes of stationery and breastpins and dolls and little stoves and dozens of handkerchiefs and inkstands and skates and snow shovels and photograph frames and little easels and boxes of watercolors and turkish paste and nougat and candied cherries and dolls houses and waterproofs and the big christmas tree lighted and standing in a wastebasket in the middle she had a splendid christmas all day she ate so much candy that she did not want any breakfast and the whole forenoon the presents kept pouring in that the expressman had not had time to deliver the night before and she went round giving the presents she had got for other people and came home and ate turkey and cranberry for dinner and plum pudding and nuts and raisins and oranges and more candy and then went out and coasted and came in with a stomach-ache crying and her papa said he would see if his house was turned into that sort of fool's paradise another year and they had a light supper and pretty early everybody went to bed cross well, well now what did i say pigs you made them act like pigs. Well, didn't they? No matter. You ought to put that into a story. Very well, then. I'll take it all out. The little girl slept very heavily, and she slept very late, but she was wakened at last by the other children dancing round her bed with their stockings full of presents in their hands. What is it? said the little girl, and she rubbed her eyes and tried to rise up in bed. Christmas! 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 they all shouted and waved their stockings. Nonsense! It was Christmas yesterday. Her brothers and sisters just laughed. We don't know about that. It's Christmas today, anyway. You come into the library and see. Then all at once it flashed on the little girl that the fairy was keeping her promise, and her year of Christmases was beginning. She was dreadfully sleepy, but she sprang up like a lark, a lark that had overeaten itself and gone to bed cross, and darted into the library. There it was again, books and portfolios and boxes of stationery and breast pins. You needn't go over it all, Papa. I guess I could remember just what was there. Well, and there was the Christmas tree blazing away, and the family picking out their presents, but looking pretty sleepy, and her father perfectly puzzled, and her mother ready to cry. I'm sure I don't see how I'm to dispose of all these things, said her mother, and her father said it seemed to him they had had something like it the day before, but he supposed he must have dreamed it. This struck the little girl as the best kind of a joke, and so she ate so much candy she didn't want any breakfast, and went round carrying presents, and had a turkey and cranberry for dinner, and then went out and coasted, and came in with a... Papa! well what now what did you promise you forgetful thing oh oh yes well the next day it was just the same thing over again but everybody getting crosser and at the end of a week's time so many people had lost their tempers that you could pick up lost tempers anywhere they perfectly strewed the ground even when people tried to recover their tempers they usually got somebody else's and it made the most dreadful mix the little girl began to get frightened keeping the secret all to herself she wanted to tell her mother but she didn't dare to and she was ashamed to ask the fairy to take back her gift it seemed ungrateful and ill-bred and she thought she would try to stand it but she hardly knew how she could for a whole year so it went on and on and it was christmas on st valentine's day and washington's birthday just the same as any day and it didn't skip even the first of april 
though everything was counterfeit that day and that was some little relief. After a while, coal and potatoes began to be awfully scarce. So many had been wrapped up in tissue paper to fool papas and mamas with. Turkeys got to be about a thousand dollars apiece. Papa. Wh what? You're beginning to fib. Well, two thousand then. And they got to passing off almost anything for turkeys. Half-grown hummingbirds and even rocks out of the Arabian Nights. The real turkeys were so scarce. And cranberries? Well, they asked a diamond apiece for cranberries. All the woods and orchards were cut down for Christmas trees, and where the woods and orchards used to be, it looked just like a stubble field with the stumps. After a while, they had to make Christmas trees out of rags and stuff them with bran like old-fashioned dolls, but there were plenty of rags because people got so poor buying presents for one another that they couldn't get any new clothes and they just wore their old ones to tatters. They got so poor that everybody had to go to the poorhouse, except the confectioners and the fancy storekeepers and the picture book sellers and the expressmen, and they all got so rich and proud that they would hardly wait upon a person when he came to buy. It was perfectly shameful. Well, after it had gone on for about three or four months, the little girl, whenever she came into the room in the morning and saw those great ugly lumpy stockings dangling at the fireplace and the disgusting presents around everywhere, used to just sit down and burst out crying. In six months, she was perfectly exhausted. She couldn't even cry any more. She just lay on the lounge and rolled her eyes and panted. About the beginning of October, she took to sitting down on dolls wherever she found them, French dolls or any kind. She hated the sight of them so. And by Thanksgiving, she was crazy and just slammed her presents across the room. By that time, people didn't carry presents around nicely anymore. They flung them over the fence or through the window or anything. And instead of running their tongues out and taking great pains to write for dear Papa or Mama or Brother or Sister or Susie or Sammy or Billy or Bobby or Jimmy or Jenny or whoever it was, and troubling to get the spelling right and then signing their names and Christmas with the year, they used to write in the gift books, take it, you'd horrid thing, and then go and bang it against the front door. Nearly everybody had built barns to hold their presents, but pretty soon the barns overflowed, and then they used to let them lie out in the rain or anywhere. Sometimes the police used to come and tell them to shovel their presents off the sidewalk or they would arrest them. I thought you said everybody had gone to the poorhouse. Well, they did go at first, but after a while the poorhouses got so full that they had to send the people back to their own houses. And they tried to cry when they got back, but they couldn't make the least sound. Why couldn't they? Because they had lost their voices saying Merry Christmas so much. Did I tell you how it was on the 4th of July? No, how was it? Well, the night before, the boys stayed up to celebrate, as they always do, and fell asleep before twelve o'clock as usual, expecting to be wakened by the bells and cannon. But it was nearly eight o'clock before the first boy in the United States woke up, and then he found out what the trouble was. As soon as he could get his clothes on, he ran out of the house and smashed a big cannon torpedo down on the pavement. But it didn't make any more noise than a damp wad of paper. And after he tried about twenty or thirty more, he began to pick them up and look at them. Every single torpedo was a big raisin. Then he just streaked it upstairs and examined his firecrackers and toy pistol and two-dollar collection of fireworks and found that they were nothing but sugar and candy painted to look like fireworks. Before ten o'clock, every boy in the United States found out that his Fourth of July things had turned into Christmas things, and then they just sat down and cried. They were so mad. There are about twenty million boys in the United States, so you can imagine what a noise they made. Some men got together before night with a little powder that hadn't turned into purple sugar yet, and they said they would fire off one cannon anyway. But the cannon burst into a thousand pieces, for it was nothing but rock candy, and some of the men nearly got killed. The Fourth of July orations all turned into Christmas carols, and when anybody tried to read the declaration, instead of saying, When in the course of human events it becomes necessary, he was sure to sing, God rest you merry gentlemen. It was perfectly awful. And how was it at Thanksgiving? Well, I'm almost afraid to tell you. I'm afraid you'll think it's wicked. Well, tell anyway. Well, before it came Thanksgiving, it had leaked out who had caused all these Christmases. The little girl had suffered so much that she had talked about it in her sleep, and after that hardly anybody would play with her. People just perfectly despised her, because if it had not been for her greediness, it wouldn't have happened. And now when it came Thanksgiving, and she wanted them to go to church and have squash pie and turkey and show their gratitude, they said that all the turkeys had been eaten up for her old Christmas dinners, and if she would stop the Christmases, they would see about the gratitude. Wasn't it dreadful? And the very next day, the little girl began to send letters to the Christmas fairy and then telegrams to stop it. But it didn't do any good. And then she got to calling at the fairy's house, but the girl that came to the door always said, not at home, or engaged, or at dinner, or something like that. 
and so it went on till it came to the old once a year christmas eve the little girl fell asleep and when she woke up in the morning she found it was all nothing but a dream no indeed it was all every bit true well what did she find out then why that it wasn't christmas at last and wasn't ever going to be any more all right now it's time for breakfast you shan't go if you're going to leave it so how do you want it left christmas once a year all right well there was the greatest rejoicing all over the country and it extended clear up into canada the people met together everywhere and kissed and cried for joy the city carts went around and gathered up all the candy and raisins and nuts and dumped them into the river and it made the fish perfectly sick and the whole united states as far out as alaska was one blaze of bonfires where the children were burning up their gift books and presents of all kinds they had the greatest time the little girl went to thank the old fairy because she had stopped its being christmas and she said she hoped she would keep her promise and see that christmas never never came again but then the fairy frowned and asked her if she was sure she knew what she meant and the little girl asked her why not and the old fairy said that now she was behaving just as greedily as ever and she'd better look out this made the little girl think it all over carefully again and she said she would be willing to have it christmas about once in a thousand years and then she said a hundred and then she said ten and at last she got down to one then the fairy said that was the good old way that had pleased people ever since christmas began and she was agreed then the little girl said what are your shoes made of and the fairy said leather and the little girl said bargain's done forever and skipped off and hippity hopped the whole way home she was so glad how will that do first rate and just then my wife popped her head in the door are you never coming to breakfast what have you been telling that child oh just a moral tale we know don't you tell what papa don't you tell what End of Christmas Every Day by W. D. Howells Times have changed, said old Scrooge as he sat by my fireside on Christmas Eve. The Christmas carol had been read, as our custom was, and the children had gone to bed so that only Scrooge and I remained to watch the dying embers. Times have changed, and I'm not appreciated as I was in the middle of the last century. People don't seem to be having so good a time. You remember the Christmas when I was converted? What larks! Up to that time I had been a squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner. Those were the very words that described me. Then the Christmas spirit took possession of me, and presto, change! All at once I became a new creature. I began to hurry about, giving all sorts of things to all sorts of people. You remember how I scattered turkeys all over the neighborhood, shouting, Here's the turkey! Hello! Whoop! How are you? Merry Christmas! And then I sat down and chuckled over my generosity till I cried. I was having the time of my life, you see. I hadn't been used to that sort of thing, and it, it went to my head. And how grateful everybody was. They took everything in the spirit of which it was offered and asked no questions. Everywhere there was an outstretched hand and a fervent God bless you for every gift. Nobody twitted me about the past. I was all at once elevated to the position of an earthly providence. Talk of fun! Was there ever such a practical joke as to scare Bob Cratchit within an inch of his life, and then raise his salary before he could even say Jack Robinson? You should have seen him jump! <laughs> How the little Cratchits shouted for joy! And when the thing was written up, all Anglo-Saxondom was smiling through its tears and saying, That's just like us! God bless us, everyone! But it's different now. Something has got into the Christmas spirit. Doing good just doesn't seem such a jolly thing as it once was, and you can't carry it off with a whoop and a hello. People are getting critical. In these days, a charitable shilling doesn't go so far as it used to and doesn't buy nearly so many God bless yous. You complain of the rise in the price of necessities of life. It isn't a circumstance to the increase in the cost of luxuries like benevolence. Almost everyone looks forward to the time when he can afford to be generous, and when he is generous, he likes to feel generous and to have other people sympathize with him. It's only human nature. A man can't be thinking about himself all the time. He gets that tired feeling that your scientific people in these days call altruism. It is an inability to concentrate his mind on his own concerns. 
In spite of himself, his thoughts wander off to other people's affairs, and he has an impulse to do them good. Now, in my day, it was the easiest thing in the world to do good. The only thing necessary was to feel good-natured, and there you were. Nowadays, the way of the benefactor is hard. It's so difficult that I, I understand you actually have schools of philanthropy. Scrooge shrugged his shoulders and seemed to shrivel at the thought of these horrible institutions. Just fancy, he continued, how I should have felt on that blessed Christmas night if, instead of starting off as an amateur angel, feeling my wings growing every moment, I had been compelled to prepare for an entrance examination. I suppose I should have been put with backwards pupils whose early education had been neglected, and should have had to learn the ABCs of charity, school of philanthropy, blah, and on the holidays, too. I have been visiting some elderly gentlemen who have had something of my experience with the spirit of Christmas. Like me, they were converted somewhat late in life. They never were in as bad a way as I was, for I did business, you may remember, in a narrow street with quite sordid surroundings, while they were financiers in a large way. Yet I suppose that they, too, were squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinners, though nobody had the courage to tell them so. Then they got tired of clutching, and their hearts warmed, and their hands relaxed, and they began to give. Never was such a giving known before. It was a perfect deluge of beneficence. A mere catalogue of the gifts would make a Christmas carol of itself. But would you believe it? They never have got the fun out of it that I got when I filled the cab full of turkeys and set out for Camden Town. The old Christmas feeling seems to have been chilled. The public has grown critical. Instead of dancing for joy, it looks suspiciously at the gifts and asks, where did they get them? It has been so impressed by the germ theory of disease that it foolishly fears that even money may be tainted. It's a preposterous situation. Generosity is a drug on the market, and gratitude can't be had at any reasonable price. Yes, I said, you're quite right. Public sentiment has changed. Gratitude is not so easily won as it was in your day, and it takes longer to transform a clutching, covetous old sinner into a serviceable philanthropist. But I do not think, Scrooge, that the Christmas spirit has really vanished. He is only a little chastened and subdued by the spirit of democracy. Well, I don't see what democracy has to do with it, said Scrooge. I'm sure that nobody ever accused me of being an aristocrat. What I'm troubled about is the decay of gratitude. If I give a poor fellow a shilling, I ought to be allowed the satisfaction of having him remove his hat and say thank you, sir, and he ought to say it as if he meant it. The heartiness of his thanksgiving is half the fun. It makes one feel good all over. But, I answered, if the fellow happens to have a good memory, he may recall the fact that yesterday you took two shillings from him, and he may think that the proper response to your sudden act of generosity is, where's that other shilling? That's what the spirit of democracy puts them up to. It's not so polite, but you must admit that it goes right to the point. I don't like it, said Scrooge. I thought you wouldn't. There are a great many people who don't like it. It's a twitting on facts that takes away a good deal of the pleasure of being generous. I should say it did, grumbled Scrooge. It makes you feel mean just when you're the most sensitive. Just think how I should have felt if, when I gave Bob Cratchit a dig in the waistcoat and told him that I had raised his salary, he had taken the opportunity to ask for back pay. It would have been most inopportune. You owed it to him, didn't you? Yes, I suppose I did, if you choose to put it that way, but Bob wouldn't have put it that way. He wouldn't take such liberties. He took what I gave him. And when I gave him more than he expected, he was all the happier, and so was I. That's what made it all seem so nice and Christmassy. We were not thinking about rights and duties. It was all free grace. Now, Scrooge, you are getting at the point. There's no concealing the fact that the spirit of democracy makes himself unpleasant sometimes. He breaks up the old pleasant relations existing not only between the lords and the commons, but between you and Bob Cratchit. 
Man is naturally a superstitious creature and is prone to worship the first thing that comes in his way. When a poor fellow sees a person who is better off than himself, he jumps to the conclusion that he is a better man and bows before him as before a wonder-working providence. When this providence smiles upon him, he is glad and receives the bounty with devout thankfulness. Is that what the old theologians used to call an uncovenanted mercy? All of this is very pleasant to one who can sign himself by the grace of God or president of a coal company or some such thing as that. The gratification extends to all the minor grades of greatness as well. The great man is ordained to give as it pleases him and the little man to receive with due meekness. The great man is always the man who has something, I suppose, Scrooge, that in your busy life, first scraping money together and then dispensing it in your joyous Christmassy way, you have had not much time for general reading or even for listening to sermons. I have always attended a divine service since my conversion, answered Scrooge piously. As for listening... Uh... Well, what I was going to say was that if you had attended to such matters, you must have noticed how much of the literature of goodwill is devoted to the praise of the blessed inequalities, how the changes are rung on the strong and the weak, the wise and the ignorant, the rich and the poor, especially the poor, who form the hub of the philanthropic universe. Nobody seems to meet another on the level. Everybody is either looking up or looking down, and they're taught how to do it. I remember attending the annual meeting of the Society for the Leaf of Indigent Children. The indigent children were first fed and then insulted by a plethoric gentleman who addressed to them a long discourse on indigence and the various duties that it entailed. And no one of the children was allowed to throw things at the speaker. They had all been taught to look grateful. Now, these inequalities do exist, and so long as they exist, all sorts of helpful offices have place. The trouble is that good people are all do doing their best to make the inequalities permanent. You have heard how divines have interpreted the text, the poor you always have with you. The good old doctrine has been that the relation between those who have not and those who have should be that of one-sided dependence. The ignorance must depend on the wise, the weak upon the strong, the poor upon the rich. As for the black, yellow, and various party-colored races, they must depend on the white man, who gaily walks off with their burdens without so much as a buyer leave. Now it is against this whole theory, however beautifully or piously expressed, that the protest has come. The spirit of democracy is a bold iconoclast and goes about smashing our idols. He laughs at the pretensions of the strong and the wise and the rich to have created the things they possess. They are not the masters of the feast. They are only those of us who have got at the head of the line, sometimes by unmannerly pushing, and have secured a place at the first table. We are not here by their leave, and we may go directly to the source of supplies. They are not benefactors, but beneficiaries." The spirit of democracy insists that they shall know their place. He rebukes even the captains of industry. And when they answer insolently, he suggests that they be reduced to the ranks. Even towards bishops and other clergy, his manner lacks that perfect reverence that belonged to an earlier time. Yet he listens to them respectfully when they talk sense. It is this spirit that plays the mischief with many of the merry old ways of doing good. To scatter turkeys or colleges among a multitude of gratefully dependent folks is the very poetry of philanthropy. But to satisfy the curiosity of an independent citizen, as to your title of these things, is a different matter. The more independent people are, the harder it is to do good to them. They are apt to have their own ideas of what they want. It's a pity, then, to have taken them so independent, said Scrooge. It spoils people to get above their proper station in life. Ah, there you are, I answered. I feared it would come to that. With all your exuberant goodwill, you haven't altogether got beyond the theory that has come down from the time when the first cave dweller bestowed on his neighbor the bone he himself didn't need and established the pleasant relation of benefactor and beneficiary. It gave him such a warm feeling in his heart that he naturally wanted to make the relation permanent. First cave dweller felt a little disappointed next day when second cave dweller, instead of coming to him for another bone, preferred to take his pointed stick 
and go hunting on his own account, seemed a little ungrateful to him, and first cave dweller felt that it would be no more than right to arrange legislation in the cave so that this should not happen again. Christian charity is a very beautiful thing, but sometimes it gets mixed up with these ideas of the cave dwellers. Sometimes it perpetuates the very evils that it laments. Perhaps you won't mind my reading a bit from a homily of St. Augustine on this very subject. St. Augustine was a man who was a very good many centuries ahead of his time. He begins his argument by saying, All love, dear brethren, consists in wishing well to those who are loved. This seems like a harmless proposition. It's the sort of thing you might hear in a sermon and think no more about it. But St. Augustine goes on to the root of the matter and asks what it means to wish well to the person you're trying to help. He comes to the conclusion that if you really wish him well, you must wish him to be at least as well off and as well able to take care of himself as you are. The first thing you know, you're wishing him to have to reach a point where he will not look up to you at all. There is a certain friendliness by which we desire at one time or another to do good to those we love, but how if there be no good that we can do? We ought not to wish men to be wretched that we may be enabled to practice works of mercy. Thou givest bread to the hungry, but better were it that none hungered, and that thou hadst none to give to. Thou clothest the naked, O oh, that all men were clothed, and that this need existed not. Take away the wretched, and the works of mercy will be at an end. But shall the ardor of charity be quenched? With a truer touch of love thou lovest the happy man to whom there is no good office that thou canst do. Purer will that love be, and more unalloyed. For if thou hast done a kindness to the wretched, perhaps thou wishest him to be subject to thee. He was in need, thou didst bestow, thou seemest to thyself greater, because thou didst bestow, than he upon whom it was bestowed. Wish him to be thine equal. There, Scrooge, is the text for the little Christmas sermon that I should like to preach to you, and to your elderly, wealthy friends who feel that they are not so warmly appreciated as they once were. Wish him to be thine equal. That is the test of charity. It's all right to give a poor devil a turkey, but are you anxious that he shall have as good a chance as you have to buy a turkey for himself? Are you really enthusiastic about so equalizing opportunities that by and by you shall be surrounded by happy, self-reliant people who have no need of your benefactions? Do you know, Scrooge, I sometimes think that it is time for someone to write a new Christmas carol, a carol that will make the world know how people are feeling and some of the best things they're doing in these days. It should be founded on justice and not on mercy. We should feed up Bob Cratchit and put some courage in him. And he should come to you and ask for a living wage, not as a favor, but as a right. And you, Scrooge, would not be offended at him, but you'd sit down like a sensible man and figure it out with him. And when the talk was over, you wouldn't feel particularly generous, and he wouldn't feel particularly grateful. It would be simple business. But you would like each other better, and the business would seem more worthwhile. And then, when you went out with the spirit of Christmas, you would ask the spirit of democracy to go with you and show you the new things that are most worth seeing. He wouldn't wait for the night, for the cheeriest things would be those that go on during business hours. He would show you some sights to make your heart glad. He would show you vast numbers of persons who have got tired of the worship of the blessed inequalities and who are going in for the equalities. They have a suspicion that there is not so much difference between the great and the small as has been supposed, and that what difference there is does not prevent a frank comradeship and a perfect understanding. They think it is better to work with people than to work for them. They think that one of the inalienable rights of man is the right to make his own mistakes and to learn the lesson from them without too much prompting. So they are a little shy of many of the more intrusive forms of philanthropy. But you should see what they're up to. The spirit of democracy will take you to visit a school that is not at all like the school you used to go to, Scrooge. The teacher has forgotten his rod and his rules and his airs of superiority. He is not teaching at all, so far as you can see. He is the center of a group of eager learners who are using their own wits and not depending on his. They are so busy observing, comparing, 
reasoning and finding out things for themselves, that he can hardly get a word in edgewise. And he seems to like it, though it is clear that if they keep on at this rate, they will soon get ahead of their teacher. And this spirit of democracy will take you to a children's court, where the judge does not seem like a judge at all, but like a big brother, who shows the boys what they ought to do and sees that they do it. He will take you to a little republic, where boys and girls who have defied laws that they did not understand are making laws of their own and enforcing them in a way that makes the ordinary citizen feel ashamed of himself. They do it all so naturally that you wonder that nobody had thought of the plan before. He will take you to a pleasant houses in unpleasant parts of the city, and there you will meet pleasant young people who are having a very good time with their neighbors and who are getting to be rather proud of their neighborhood. After you have had a cup of tea, they may talk over with you the neighborhood problems. If you have any sensible suggestion to make, these young people will listen to you. But if you begin to talk condescendingly about the poor, they'll change the subject. They are not philanthropists. They're only neighbors. I hope he may take you, Scrooge, this spirit of democracy, to some of the charity organizations I know about. I realize that you are prejudiced against that sort of thing. It seems so cold and calculating compared with your impulsive way of doing good. And you'll probably quote the lines about organized charity scrimped and iced in the name of a cautious statistical Christ. Never mind about the statistics. They only mean that these people are doing business on a larger scale than did all the good people who could carry the details in their heads. What I want you to notice is the way in which the scientific interest does away with that patronizing pity that was the hardest thing to bear in the old-time charities. These modern experts go about mending broken fortunes in very much the same way in which surgeons mend broken bones. The patient doesn't feel under any oppressive weight of obligation. He's given them such a good opportunity to show their skill. And the doctors have caught this spirit, too. Instead of looking wise and waiting for people to come to them in the last extremity, they have enlisted in social service. You should see them going about opening windows and forcing people to poke their heads out in the night air and making landlords miserable by their calculations about cubic feet and investigating sweatshops and analyzing foodstuffs. It is their way of bringing in a Merry Christmas. And the spirit of democracy will take you to workshops, where you may see a new kind of captain of industry in friendly consultation with the new kind of labor leader. For the new captain is not a chief of banditti, interested only in the booty he can get for himself, and the new leader is not a conspirator waiting for a chance to plunge his knife into the more successful bandit's back. These two are responsible members of a great industrial army, and they realize their responsibility. They have not met to exchange compliments, they are not sentimentalists, but shrewd men of affairs who have met to plan a campaign for the common welfare. They don't take any credit for it, for they do not expect to give to any man any more than is due. Yet there are a good many Christmas dinners involved in the cool, business-like consultation. Afterwards, the spirit of democracy will take you to a church, where the minister is preaching from the text, Ye are all kings and priests, as if he believed it. And you will believe it too, and go on your way wondering at the many sacred offices in the world. You will hurry on from the church to shake hands with this new kind of politician. He is not the dignified statesman you have read about and admired afar off, who has every qualification for high office except the ability to get himself elected. This man knows the game of politics. He is not fastidious and likes nothing better than to be in the thick of a scrimmage. He has not the scholar's scorn of the aggregate mind. He thinks that it is a very good kind of mind if it is only rightly interpreted. He has the idea that what all of us want is better than what some few of us want, and that when all of us make up our minds to work together, we can get what we want without asking anybody's leave. He thinks that what all of us want is fair play. And so he goes straight for that, without much regard for special interests. It is a simple program, but it's wonderful what a difference it makes. There never was a time, Scrooge, when the message of goodwill was so widely interpreted in action, or when it took hold of so many kinds of men. 
Perhaps you wouldn't mind my reading another little bit from St. Augustine. Two are those to whom thou dost alms, two hunger, one for bread, the other for righteousness. Between these two famishing persons, thou, the doer of the good work, art set. The one craves what he may eat, the other craves what he may imitate. Thou feedest the one, give thyself as a pattern to the other. So hast thou given to both. The one thou hast caused to thank thee for satisfying his hunger, the other thou hast made to imitate thee by setting him a worthy example. It is this hunger for simple justice that is the great thing. And there are people who are giving their whole lives to satisfy it. What we need is to realize what it all means and to get that joyous thrill over it that came to you when you found for the first time that life consisted not in getting but in giving. It's a wonderful giving, this giving of oneself, and people do appreciate it. When you have ministered to a person's self-respect, when you have contributed to his self-reliance, when you have inspired him to self-help, you have given him something. And you are conscious of it, and so is he, though you both find it hard to express in the old terms. All the old Christmas cheer is in these reciprocities of friendship that have lost touch of condescension. We need some genial imagination to picture to all of the happiness that is being diffused by people who have come to look upon themselves not as God's ominers, but as sharers with others in the common good. I wish we had a new Dickens to write it up. If you're waiting for that, you'll wait a long time, said Scrooge. Perhaps so, but the people are here all the same, and they're getting on with their work. There was once in a faraway country where few people have ever traveled, one of the most wonderful churches that the world has ever seen, with huge stone columns and dark passages and a grand entrance leading to the main room of the church. In the farthest corner was the organ, and this organ was so loud that sometimes when it played, the people for miles around would close their shutters as if to prepare for a great thunderstorm. At one corner of the church was a great tower with ivy growing over it as far up as one could see. I say as far as one could see because the tower rose so far into the sky that it was only in very fair weather that anyone claimed to be able to see the top. Even then, one could not be certain that it was in sight. And as the men who built the church had been dead for hundreds of years, everyone had forgotten how high the tower was supposed to be. Now all the people knew that at the top of the tower was a wonderful chime of Christmas bells. They had hung there ever since the church had been built and were the most beautiful sounding bells in all the world. Some people thought that this was because a great musician had cast them and arranged them in their place. Others said it was because of their great height, which reached way up where the air was purest and clearest. The strange thing about the chimes, though, was that no one had heard them ring for years and years. It was the custom on Christmas Eve for all the people in the kingdom to bring to the church their offerings to the Christ child. And when the greatest and best offering was laid on the altar, there used to come sounding above the music of the choir the glorious pealing of the Christmas chimes as they rang out far above in the tower. Some said that the wind rang them, while others believed that they were so high it was the angels who caused them to ring. But for many, many long years, the chimes had never been heard at all. Although no one knew exactly why this was so, it was said that the people had been growing less careful of their gifts for the Christ child, and that no offering was brought which was great enough to deserve the music of the chime. Every Christmas Eve, the rich people still crowded to the altar 
each one trying to bring some gift better than the others without giving anything that he really wanted for himself. And the church was crowded with those who hoped that their offering would make the chimes ring. But though the service was splendid and the offering plentiful, only the roar of the wind could be heard far up the stone tower. The chimes remain silent. from the city in a little country village where nothing could be seen of the great church but the top of the tower there lived a boy named Pedro and his little brother they knew very little about the Christmas chimes but they'd heard of the wonderful service in the church on Christmas Eve Pedro had a small piece of silver for which he had worked very hard and this was to be his offering while he was sorry he had to make such a small gift since he had nothing else he hoped that the Christ child would understand. The day before Christmas was bitterly cold, with an icy wind that sent the lonely snowflakes flying in the air and formed a hard white crust on the ground. Pedro and little brother were able to slip away quietly early in the afternoon, and by nightfall, they had trudged so far hand in hand that they saw the lights of the big city just ahead of them. They were about to enter one of the great gates in the wall that surrounded it, when suddenly they saw something dark on the snow. It was a poor old woman who had fallen just outside the city, too sick and too tired to enter in where she might have found shelter. The soft white snow had made a sort of pillow for her, and she would soon be so sound asleep in the wintry air that no one could ever waken her again. All this Pedro saw in a moment as he knelt down beside her. He knew that he could not leave her, so he sadly told little brother to go on alone. But little brother didn't want to because that would mean that Pedro would miss the Christmas festival. But Pedro, much as he wanted to go, knew that he couldn't leave the poor old woman whose face looked like the Madonna in the chapel window. Little brother still waited, hoping that Pedro would decide to go with him. But Pedro told him to hurry so that he would not miss the service. Then Pedro gave him the little piece of silver he'd been saving and asked him to slip up to the altar when no one was looking and lay it down as his offering. And so Pedro hurried little brother off to the city, trying hard to keep back the tears as he heard the crunching footsteps sounding farther and farther away in the twilight. It was very hard remaining behind, helping the poor old woman in the snow, for it meant he had to miss the music and the splendor of the Christmas celebration that he'd been planning for so long. great church was a most wonderful place that night. When the organ played and the thousands of people sang the glorious hymns, the walls shook with the sound, and little Pedro, far away in the cold snow outside the city walls, felt the earth tremble around him. After the beautiful service was over, the majestic procession with all the splendid offerings to be laid on the altar began. Rich men and beautiful ladies of the kingdom marched proudly up to the altar to lay down their gifts to the Christ child in the hope that their offering would make the chimes ring. A famous warrior strode forward in his suit of gleaming armor to deposit his offering, a great sword, all encrusted with the rarest jewels. All the people leaned forward excitedly in their seats 
listening eagerly for the sound of the chimes. But the bells were silent. Behind him came a beautiful noblewoman, clad in a gown of blue and white silk, bearing a lovely picture painted by the kingdom's greatest artist. But still the chimes did not ring. Then followed the richest banker in the realm, bearing a huge golden casket so heavy that he could hardly carry it. With a confident smile on his face, he opened his treasure chest, revealing a vast quantity of glittering gold and jewels. But the chimes still did not ring. The procession moved on, and the altar was crowded with many and rare gifts of every kind from all the corners of the kingdom. Those who had brought offerings stood in a row behind the altar, silent and sullen in their great disappointment, for each one had fervently hoped his or her gift would bring forth the ringing of the chimes. Yet still the chimes remained strangely silent. All that the vast throng assembled in the church could hear was the cold, cold wind sighing through the great stone tower far above. On the faces of the assembled throng in the church, there were written expressions of disappointment and shattered hope, for all thought that surely with such a magnificent collection of offerings, the glorious chimes would at last sound forth. But alas, they were as silent as could be. Then suddenly the hopes of the multitude arose. the king of the country himself marched down the aisle to present his gift to the Christ child. Even he, like all the others, hoped that he would win the ringing of the chime. took off his crown, heavy with sparkling diamonds and rubies and other precious stones, and to the amazement of the assembled throng, he laid it gleaming on the altar as his offering for the holy child. As the king stood there with an expectant smile on his face, the multitude leaned forward eagerly, holding their breath in excitement and suspense. Surely the chimes will ring tonight, they said. Nothing like this has ever happened within the memory of man. And if they don't ring after this noble gift of the great king, why should they ever ring at all? But still the chimes were silent. And so the beautiful service was over. The assembled people were plainly disappointed as they sadly prepared to leave the church. Slowly they made their way out. Suddenly, the organist stopped playing as though he were stricken. The people were stunned. All eyes strained toward the altar, where a small boy was kneeling in prayer. Yes, yes, it was little brother, Pedro's little brother. He had just put something on the altar beside all the other magnificent gifts. It was a little piece of silver. Then... Miracle of miracles, the chimes sounded forth. At last, the glorious chimes were ringing. The people were so excited they could hardly believe it, for no one in the church had ever heard the chimes ring before. And then... Beside the altar stood an angel of the Lord, surrounded by the glowing rays of a golden halo. The angel raised her hand as if to cast blessings upon little brother. Then she turned to the assembled multitude and spoke. Tonight, after lo, these many long years, your wonderful Christmas chimes have sounded again. There were many beautiful gifts to the Lord. But verily I say unto you, it is not jewels or other riches of this world that please the Christ child. 
What pleases him is love and unselfish sacrifice. Tonight the chimes have rung not because of the many wonderful gifts, but simply because of the love and unselfish sacrifice of a little boy. Well, I hope you enjoyed the melange of stories that we did today. Uh, thematically, there are connections, and that's going to continue for the rest of our 12 Days of Craftlet. If you are a Craftlet listener, or at least a Craftlet listener for probably the last six years, you may have recognized the voice of our second reader. That was my husband, Andrew. And aside from helping me out with holiday audio. The other thing Andrew's been up to is he's finished his third mystery book. So if you are interested in mysteries, you may enjoy reading his series. It's all the same group of people. It's all in and around Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, and yeah, I'm kind of proud of the guy. Uh, all that information will be in the show notes in the description below. And the other thing I wanted to let you know, also a good Christmas present, just like books are, uh, we're doing a tour. Craftlet's going on the road. We're going to go to Denmark and Sweden in May 2024. If you are interested in joining us, I got to tell you, it is the greatest group of people that I get to travel with every, usually it's every other year. Uh, this year will be no different. Fantastic. Go to holidayvacations.com. And then at the bottom of that first screen, you'll see a little space where you can click on keyword. Click that and type in Craftlet, and it'll take you right to the brochure with all the information you could possibly need to know. If something isn't explained in there, there's a 1-800 number, call it. They are lovely people. They will absolutely help you out. And the deposit for reserving a space on the trip, because there's only a few spaces left, the deposit is not very much money, and it's not fully due until the last day that everything is fully do. So you have some flexibility with that. And like I said, it's a great thing to ask for for Christmas. Come and have fun with us in Denmark and Sweden. All right. Thanks so much for joining us. Talk to you tomorrow. Have a good one. Take care. Bye. If you like what we do here, please consider liking and subscribing on iTunes, thumbs upping and subscribing on YouTube. You can visit patreon.com slash craftlit and become a patron of this art. And you can always go to linktree, l-i-n-k-t-r dot e-e slash craftlit channel. And from there, you can get links out to all of the social media, all of the places that craftlit lives. It's, it's a nice hub that you can go to to get all the stuff, all the good stuff. And I keep forgetting to mention, we also have a Facebook group with the loveliest group of people, as you might imagine. They're just awesome. Makers and readers. And people who hadn't been readers before, but are now. I like that. All right. You take care of yourself. Have a great one. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. I heard the bells on Christmas Day, their old familiar carols play, and wild and sweet the words repeat of peace on earth, good will to men. I thought how as the day had come, the belfries of all Christendom had rolled along the unbroken song of peace on earth, good will to men. Till ringing, singing on its way, the world revolved from night to day, a voice 
a chime, a chant sublime of peace on earth, good will.